I'm a content creator. Let's talk about burnout. That's it. That's my intro. Hi, I'm Amanda. You're watching Swell Entertainment. And before any of my returning subscribers get freaked out, this is not me announcing taking a break from YouTube or anything. We are just quite literally discussing burnout. I was on the verge of experiencing burnout at one point in time, and I'm also a content creator. So that's why we're doing this. I'm also wearing this button up shirt because I thought, you know, since we're talking about business stuff that I should like dress like a business professional in this like trendy collared button up. But I feel like I just look more like a librarian than I usually do. Yeah, I don't know how I can avoid that. The reason I'm making this video is because it seems like lately there has been a rise in articles being written about creator burnout and creators experiencing burnout. I'm assuming that this has a lot to do with the rise in TikTok creators. So we're gonna talk about that and why I think that's a thing, but also I'm going to share my own experiences with burnout, specifically being on the edge of burnout last year, because I'm coming up on my one year anniversary of being a full time content creator. Yay! I feel I am mostly qualified to talk about this because a lot of these articles specifically talk about creators who are mostly mid-sized creators nowadays experiencing burnout, whereas previously it used to be like giant creators, people with like a couple million or one million or close to a million, that type of thing. But I have over 200,000 subscribers, so I'm considered, I guess, mid-size as a content creator now versus when I was a micro-influencer before. Before we go on and talk about one of these articles, talk about some of these content creating experiences, these platforms and how they do nothing to protect their creators, let me first thank the sponsors for this video, Cerebral. Cerebral is an online health platform that provides management for clients with therapy and medication for insomnia, anxiety, and depression, all for a flat monthly rate. I understand how anxiety inducing it can be to get a handle on your anxiety or your mental health by taking that step into therapy or speaking with a care provider. And the great thing about Cerebral is that you can do it all from the comfort of your own home on your own time. You can message your counselor at any time. So it's basically like having a counselor in your pocket as well. Cerebral offers a comprehensive care model that helps you get the best type of long-term care and management for your mental health. Cerebral is incredibly affordable, even without insurance. I've been using Cerebral for the last couple of months. And honestly, I cannot emphasize to you enough how important it has been to have someone who is completely impartial to my life to share my anxiety with and to help work through some of my issues. Cerebral offers three plans, medication and care counseling, medication and therapy, and therapy. If you'd like to take the next step in your mental health journey, go ahead and click the link in my description box and get started on your questionnaire to get partnered with your care provider. Your first month starts at only $30. Thank you again to Cerebral for sponsoring this video. So like I said, I've been a content creator full-time for coming up on a year in August. At the end of January, I moved out here to LA. So I am officially technically an LA influencer. Yes, saying that out loud makes my skin crawl, but that's the truth because I decided that not only am I a YouTuber, I also want to be an actor, which I'm just really batting 200, aren't I? <laughs> That's not a saying. Why did I say it like that? Like I said, there's a variety of articles that I've been seeing a lot lately talking about creator burnout. And for this particular video, I'm gonna be mostly talking about this one from Vox titled, The Influencers Are Burned Out 2. And this is written by Rebecca Jennings, who is a digital culture writer. Obviously I'll link this down below if you would like to read it yourself. This came out in May. The article starts out with, earlier this month, the writer and English professor Barrett Swanson published a story in Harper's about his five days at Clubhouse. The collective of dozens of college age social media hopefuls living in a smattering of content mansions in Los Angeles. He emerged with a sneaking suspicion that maybe all of this is bad, not only for the world, but for the influencers themselves. It's easily the best and most depressing piece of journalism about famous TikTokers I've ever read. A slouching towards Bethlehem for influencers. Here are some things Swanson witnesses on his visit. A 19 year old who just made $60,000 by filming a lady in the tramp style kiss with his girlfriend as spawn con for a chicken fingers joint, a list of video ideas which includes pranks and tuxedos, a kid who, out of nowhere, claimed that Hitler invented sex dolls based on a TikTok he just watched, an influencer manager who appears to be in the thrall of QAnon, pervasive neglect for the influencers on the part of their managers, and repeated offers to help Swanson become a TikTok influencer himself, as though the only reason for visiting it all was, of course, to take a little piece of the celebrity pie as his own. Several times throughout my trip, I think I can see the toll this takes on them, a kind of pallid desperation that flickers across their faces. At one point, Brandon, one of the influencers, comes over and says, the scary thing is you never know how long this is going to last. And I think that's what eats a lot of us up at night. It's like, what's next? How long can we entertain everyone for? How long before no one cares? And what is your life was worth nothing? 
Yikes. This article in particular seems to pull from a lot of other articles talking about creator burnout, which is why I chose this one to kind of frame this video around in a sense. And that's because I think that creator burnout is something that is becoming just more normalized and is less of like a big deal when it happens. Like it's more normal for someone to be like, hey, I'm gonna stop posting or I'm gonna take a break because I need to work on my mental health. This is just getting to be too much to me. I need to take a break. And I think it's good in a sense that people are more comfortable now voicing when they are having difficulties with their mental health and they feel more comfortable saying, hey, I need a breather to make sure I am okay, to make sure I don't spiral. Because I think for a long time, the you just need to keep going and push through it because you're living the dream and the dream is what everyone wants and you have it. So you need to suck it up because everyone else wants what you have. I think that's incredibly harmful. I do think it's a good thing that people are becoming more comfortable with saying, hi, I'm experiencing extreme anxiety because of how people message me in my DMs or how the comment section, I need to take a break. I think it's a good thing that people are voicing that. I also think it's a bad thing that it is becoming normalized because it's so widespread. Does that make sense? I have no idea if I'm explaining this properly. I don't have a psych degree. I, I took like two psych classes in my life. I do think that the rise in popularity of TikTok as a platform has led to a rise of just instant influencers, instant creators. That has led to a rise of people just completely on the edge of burnout and spiraling at any given moment. Someone's gonna get mad at me for this, but this is not like a trauma Olympics thing. This is just me like trying to break this down in as simple terms as possible. So take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt, I guess you could say. But I believe that at this point in time, TikTokers, like people who are just instantly popular are more at risk of burnout than someone who's a YouTuber like myself. Mainly that has to do with money and also content. YouTube and TikTok are two drastically different platforms. I don't think I have to tell you that. At the end of the day, 20,000 views on YouTube is worth way more than 3 million views on TikTok. And that's the main point I wanna make here is that yes, the algorithm on TikTok is better, but the financial security almost, security is a very loosely, I'm using that very generously. There is more of a financial incentive for YouTube. So there's more stability with YouTube as a YouTuber than as a TikToker. The main differences in the algorithms between YouTube and TikTok is that I, as a YouTuber, I could have 5 million subscribers tomorrow. There will still be a large swath of YouTube users who will never even be shown one of my thumbnails. They will never be even given the opportunity to watch one of my videos unless they seek it out. Every time I post a video on TikTok, it has the potential to be shown to every single user on TikTok. Talk. And that in itself is powerful and dangerous <laughs> because you have some people who once they start getting a little bit of traction on TikTok, they're like, okay, the algorithm likes this, so I can only do this. And it's kind of like a forcing of a niche, like forcing a certain persona, whereas YouTube, it's smarter to niche down or you can do what I do and just be aggressively against niching down aside from me sitting here and talking to you. That's my niche. Hi, I'm Amanda. You're watching Swell Entertainment. That's really all my niche is. I can kind of mostly make a video about whatever I want at this point. And as long as I'm sitting here and explaining something to you, you will probably watch it. That's mostly how I avoid burnout. On TikTok, they kind of force a niche on you because if you try to start doing something else or even if you don't do something else for whatever reason maybe you are still making the same content you've been making the entire time but something i'm seeing a lot on tiktok and i've been seeing a lot for the last year and a half i would say is people who i'm following on tiktok they post videos and then they post two or three videos that don't do as well maybe it's a sharp drop off maybe it's a little bit of a drop off but then they instantly talk about being shadow banned immediately. I'm not saying that that's not a thing that happens because especially on TikTok, I have seen it. It does happen. However, it's almost like kind of blaming the boogeyman when it's your coat hanging on the hanger. Does that make sense? It seems like I am noticing TikTokers kind of forcing the distance between what the problem could actually be, which is that 
people just don't want to watch your content anymore, or they are just not as interested in this one, or hey, you're only doing the same thing. I got bored watching you do the same thing over and over again. So I'm going to go find something else for whatever reason, you know, your video is not being shared or posted or liked or commented or whatever. And then people are trying to distance themselves from like the issue. So it's like, oh, it's not me that they don't like. It's the, the algorithm. I'm shadow banned. Like they're not showing my content. That's why I'm not getting the same number of views or likes or whatever that I'm used to getting. Part of it is a rewarding of posting repeatedly. TikTok has this thing and it seems to be the case where the more videos you post, the better you're going to do. Again, like I said, every video you post has the potential to be shown to every single user on TikTok. Therefore, the more videos you post, the more likely you are to grow. That's just how it's going to be. However, now they're saying that, hey, if you don't post as often, you may actually get shadow banned. They're just not gonna show your videos to as many people. Is there proof of this? Who knows? Something I've noticed from years of not just being on YouTube, but consuming content from social media is that social media is ever changing. At the end of the day, TikTok is still a fairly new platform in the grand scheme of things. It's going to continue to change. To look at it as a full-time profession or even just a long-term option, I think is incredibly dangerous for a lot of these content creators. But at the same time, they don't really have other options to look at other things because TikTok makes it incredibly hard to branch out into other platforms like YouTube and such. Like some people, you have Charlie DeMello's, you have certain people in the Hype House, Sway House, whatever, who are able to kind of diversify their content. And I'm 90% certain that's just their managers. It, it, some of them are boring as hell, I'm sorry. Some of you are boring as hell. 90% of it is just like who you know, and then their managers being very good and having some good content connections. You know, I think that's some of it, but that's not common for every person on TikTok. That's not common for every single YouTuber. Most of these platforms, TikTok, YouTube, the like, rely on people, I don't wanna say like me, but like me, because I already said mid-sized creators. Mid-sized creators like myself to make a bulk part of the content for their channel. They're only gonna promote the handful of selections, like don't even get me started on the YouTube trending page. They're only gonna promote a handful of people, a handful of specialty channels and people that they like, but the bulk of their money comes from people like me and channels like myself of the same size. But where the difference comes in with TikTok and YouTube is that I am able to make some form of a living being a full-time mid-sized YouTuber, whereas someone who has maybe 250,000 followers on TikTok could very easily not be able to pay their light bill. You know, like it's very different. And I have a whole other video planned out for talking about the absolute bullshit that is the TikTok creator fund. ByteDance is making so much money and running even more ads now, and they're still paying creators crumbs. TikTokers who are now reliant on this platform to maintain their social media presence, they can't even make a living off of what they're doing. So whereas someone like me, who is able to not only live in LA by myself and pay my bills, and am I going off and buying a Ferrari? No, mainly because I don't want a fucking Ferrari. But also I know that this could disappear tomorrow because YouTubers that I watched when I was in middle school, hell, even high school, hell, even college, no longer have the audience that they used to, or they are just completely in the wind or doing other things. I am convinced that this, everything I have could disappear tomorrow. So though I have more than a livable salary, I am still living far below my means because I want to save money for the future, invest in my future and do a variety of other things because I know this could go away at any point. And I think TikTokers, that's even worse. Like I mentioned from Brandon in that article, these people could disappear at any second, but also it's like TikTok, as a platform as well, there's still a lawsuit with the US, you know? Like if you're a US content creator, good luck. I'm not saying that making more money prevents burnout. That's not what I'm saying. I know that's may have seemed where that was going, but that's not it. The point with avoiding burnout and my own experience with burnout is trying to find a way to not only diversify your content and where you are making money, but diversify what you are doing with your time so that not everything you are doing revolves around making content and being on. I, for the most part, don't have a social media personality. I am me. Hi, 
sometimes I swear less, you know, than I do in real life, or I am more polished, I cut out my ums. Most of you who have seen me on live streams, I'm for the most part the same person I am here on these videos as I am in a live stream. And then if you meet me in person, I'm gonna freak out and probably have a panic attack because I'm awkward as hell. So I'm, I'm the same person in real life, but it's gonna take me a second to be, <laughs> to have a legitimate conversation with you. I am not smiling and peppy and happy 100% of the time, so I'm not going to make videos where I'm smiling and happy 100% of the time because that's not realistic for me. But some people have built their careers around Around a persona that they have fabricated and that alone will drive someone insane. So now let me tell you about my experience with burnout when I became a profitable YouTuber last year in the midst of a pandemic after making content for close to five years. I started this channel when I was 16. If you want to hear a full breakdown of like what I've talked about with YouTube and stuff like go ahead and watch my thanks for 100k video. I did a full deep dive of like everything that I've done up until this point why I started YouTube wasn't for the best of Reasons, but like I was 16, I was a dumbass. Go watch that video. But at the end of 2019, I had made the decision that I was going to take my 2020, which was going to be my year off from school. I had finished my associate's degrees. I had two at the time. And I was like, I'm gonna take a year off before I apply to university to work and save money, but I'm also going to give a go at this content creation thing. I am going to throw myself into this completely because there was one consistency that I had heard from people who weren't very big and then they became big. And this is absolutely the truth for me as well, YouTube really started taking off for them when they started treating it like a job. However, at the same time, I had a job. I was working full time. And so at the start of 2020, I started posting one video a week, whereas previously I'd post maybe one to two videos a month. But one of my videos took off in the algorithm and I was traveling alone at the time. I was covering a UFO convention for another video. Hi, go ahead and watch that. I called my dad hyperventilating because I suddenly had 20,000 subscribers within two hours when I had previously been stuck at like 6,000 for like a year and a half. And then when I came home from my trip, I went to lunch with a friend and she was like, hey, what's the video at? I pulled it out and then I started hyperventilating into my fries because 500,000 people had seen my face and I was not mentally prepared for that. Now again, I had wanted that, I had wanted to be successful on YouTube. That was the fantasy that I had. I was like, oh, you know, maybe eventually this will happen. Maybe this will eventually be a full-time job. But wanting something and then having it is very different and sometimes horrifying, okay? So the way that I dealt with that sudden influx of, oh my God, there's more eyes on me, is to just keep doing what I had been planning on doing. I didn't start making the same content that was the same type of content that the video that had blown up. I just started doing the planned videos that I had decided I was going to be doing. And even if I had decided like, oh yeah, hey, I'm gonna be an on-camera audience member and that's gonna be my shtick on YouTube. I would have been screwed because then a week after I got back, uh, <laughs> California shut down. Even though I started making more money on YouTube and I started getting more views and consistent views, I was still not making like a livable wage at the start. It still takes a while. So I kept my day job. And even though the pandemic originally cut my hours, I was then making enough money from YouTube that I could still help support myself and my family, which was great and incredible. And then YouTube became even more of a time suck because I was now a full-time YouTuber and a full-time content creator, essentially, while also working full-time as a barista in the service industry, which I'm sorry, maybe this was an Orange County thing. People were assholes during the pandemic. I had worked in the service industry for four years prior to the pandemic. It was like the four years I had spent in the service industry Every horrible experience I'd ever had with, with a customer, anything condensed and doubled in those four months. It was like every single hour on your shift, someone was gonna swear in your face and give you a hard time that you were making them not get you sick. Like it was very odd, very weird, incredibly stress inducing. I was hyperventilating constantly. I wasn't sleeping because I was also being a full-time content creator because I had bills to pay. So what ended up happening with me and why I ended up quitting my job in August, I, I wasn't sleeping because I was making sure content. And at the time I was doing literally everything myself. Didn't have a manager, didn't have an editor. I was doing everything myself and I, 
wasn't doing great. <laughs> One day I was on my, my lunch break and I was like eating a banana cause like I was barely able to keep food down at a weird time. Eating in my car, had my computer in my lap, editing a video on my 30 minute lunch break, trying to get something down. And I felt like this, I had like this out of body experience for a moment where I felt myself quite literally drifting. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna burn out. Like that's what this is. I've done this before. I experienced burnout in high school. It sucks, got Bell's palsy, not pleasant. And I didn't care. I acknowledged that I was drifting towards burnout and I just totally didn't care because I was living the dream. I was making money, making content. And it didn't matter that I was drowning. It didn't matter because I was doing what I wanted so badly. And that's what scared the shit out of me. It didn't matter that I was going to be spiraling, like that I was on the verge of spiraling. It just didn't matter. What bothered me was how I felt completely apathetic to the fact that I was on the verge of burnout. And I told myself I was gonna stick it out another two weeks and make it to like the end of July to, you know, hand in my two weeks notice. And then two days later, we had another horrible shift. And I was like, I, I went into <laughs> what we called the dungeon at the coffee shop for my break. And I just sat on the floor and I texted my dad. I was like, I'm gonna write the note right fucking now and hand it in. I, I can't do this. I'm gonna have a panic attack and throw a cup of coffee at someone's face. It, it was a bad time. Um, so I, I handed in my two weeks notice and then you know I quit my job and I, I did that. And it was bad at first, the anxiety of, am I gonna be able to make enough money to pay my bills? And luckily at the time I was living at home, I did not move to LA immediately. I did not buy a brand new car. I still drive the car that I got when I was 18. I live in LA now, but I made sure I had time and savings and things to do before I did this move. For the first couple months, it was horrifying and nerve wracking and I didn't know what to do my, with myself because even now I was quite literally a full-time influencer. It was still a terrifying experience. And there are times now, even though now I do have better systems in place and I now have an editor. William, if you would like to hop on and like show your face, if you don't want to just put like hi in big message letters over here, whatever you feel like doing, it's your call. I was spending so much time editing throughout the day and then I came out here and I was like, okay, I need to do other things. I was once again, sort of spiraling a little bit, but not even just spiraling. I just had no time for myself or to even think. And so outsourcing my editing, even though editing is something that I love to do, was something that I really needed to do for my own mental health. And you know, it's been great, I, William's awesome. And so this is my long winded way of saying that like, I know hiring an editor is not the way to fix problems for TikTokers and that you shouldn't just quit your job because you're being overwhelmed because you are building something. I, I think it just, if anything, I wanna tell you to like, kind of just take stock of your life. Like where can you cut out some extra time just for yourself, you know, like ever since, I hired an editor, I started uh, making myself read more and I don't do anything with the content, I'm just reading, you know, to read. And I'm making myself read like a book a week. I'm taking time to learn Spanish. I'm taking 20 minutes out of my day to learn Spanish every day. I consume content that has nothing to do with YouTube so it doesn't feel like homework. And I spend time with my friends or I call up my friends and we FaceTime because we're still in a pandemic and people are all over the place and I now live in LA. I don't know, I just think if anything with content content creation is one, set up systems for yourself to like let yourself recharge. At the end of the day, whether you agree with this or not, creators are that, they are creatives. Whether you are famous for being hot, famous for doing YouTube, famous for doing crazy pranks, you are a creative and you need to find ways to help yourself recharge so that you can continue to do creative things. Does that make sense? I'm saying this really weirdly. I know in this creator economy that we are all just kind of thrust in now and the creator economy has helped me pay for my life. I'm not dissing the creator economy, but there is this belief that you need to do everything yourself or that you need to constantly be grinding and constantly be monetizing every aspect of your life in order to make money. And for some people that works, some people that doesn't. And I think you just need to take stock of your life and think, okay, I wanna do X, Y, and Z. Can I do this? Hey, I feel like shit, I'm gonna take a nap today. You know, one should be pulling all-nighters seven nights a week. It's a frustration for my part because I, 
I don't know how to fix the TikTok issue. I really don't. Because at the end of the day, it's a completely different platform. I don't have a very large audience on TikTok, nor am I really intending to make one. Because again, like I said, I would rather have 20,000 views on YouTube than 3 million on TikTok, okay? Because one, just you make a TikTok from months ago. Sure, maybe it's gonna have longevity to it, but it's not gonna keep consistently growing the way that a YouTube video potentially could. I mean, I don't know. If anything, just, take a breath. If you suddenly have an audience, take a breath, you know, don't immediately move out to LA. Don't trust random strangers who tell you they can make you famous. Never do that. I'm going to go ahead and end this here because I'm spiraling and I want to make it clear because I don't want it to come across as if I don't love my job. I tell people all the time that I love my job. Like when my friends are like, hey, what's your video gonna be on this week? And I get to get so excited to share with them about how I am making a video about freaking Squishmallows or about some cult thing on TikTok or about how YouTubers and TikTokers are gonna punch each other in the face. I love my job. I get to make money talking about random things and literally whatever I want. And for some reason, you guys seem to like that. And I don't want it ever to come across that I'm ungrateful. I just think that there needs to be a work-life balance even when your personality is your job. That's my main point, is that you gotta find a work-life balance regardless of what you do. And I know that that's very hard during the pandemic when a lot of work moved home, but I think TikTokers are still kind of figuring out the best way to monetize anything, let alone find a way to balance that with life and you know not relying everything on, not putting all your eggs in one basket, I guess. Are you a content creator? Do you think anything I said made sense? Let me know, comment down below. Do you think I'm just complaining? Let me know, comment down below. Shout out to my patrons. Thank you so much for supporting me on Patreon and helping me keep my lights on. If you'd like to also support me on Patreon, that'll be listed down below. If you'd like to follow me on my social media, that'll be all up here. And that's gonna be it. Have a lovely day, take a nap, goodbye. Diversifying content, diversifying income. We've got merch down below. We've got my Patreon, like I said, setting up other options, even though I said, don't monetize every aspect of your life. Having other options so that me sitting here in front of the camera is not my sole source of keeping my power on is also another great way to like provide balance in my life. Again, circles, hi, bye. Thank you, Ali, Alan, Alex, Brandon, Cameron, Christopher, Chris, Cody, Colton, Crash, PC, Destiny, Devin, Dirty, and Don, Elliot, Evan, Feckless, Hopes, Holla, Joker, Ray, Joe, John, M, Jordan, Joseph, Kenny, Kevin, Kim, Kristen, Lex, Lisa, Luis, Manga, Matt, Matt, O, Matthew, S, Meme, Lord, The Red, Michael, Michael, Jane, Nathaniel, Pat, Pilot, Rob, Robbie, Robert, Ross, Sam, Simon, Stefan, Tasha, Timothy, Tom, Wendy, William, Zendry.